And so Hermes here is this third element between the opposites. And so here he is flitting. So what could this mean for us psychologically? Well, I think Hermes and Mercurius and the spirit of Mercurius is that which captures our interest. So if this is interesting right now, the reason it's interesting is because there's some knowledge structures, there's some stuff that all of you have learned in the past and some ideas that relate to these ideas, and there's some newness, there's some novelty. So there's some routine, some knowledge structures, something that's known, something that's grounded in predictability and comprehension. You're like, yeah, I get that. I, I can, I've got something to relate these ideas to, yeah. And then there also, there's also a bit of like, okay, this is new. What's this? Um, okay, that's a novel concept. And so this is actually how the understanding is operating, is this syzygy, this um, coincidentia appositorum between the known and the unknown. Um, and this is this content that I'm presenting is material. That's it's content. It's material. So it's matter. It's actually we can perceive it through our senses. Okay, which means it's of the earth. Uh, but we're also perceiving it through through the spirit, through the mind, uh, and um, you know the mind is intangible. Like we haven't yet measured a thought. But um, let me know when that happens. So there's there's that's how understanding is occurring is through this, through this, through Hermes, through the symbol of Hermes, through the symbol of Mercurius. So I think this is also the way to truth. So in terms of if we're thinking about how to live our lives and how to, you know, how to how to find ourselves, how to how to live authentically to what we feel, well. Um, the alchemical perspective is that that's already um, it's kind of like pregnant in your experience and it manifests itself through Hermes through that which captures your attention it seizes your attention it's something very very interesting and there's some wisdom to the fact that it is interesting and so to follow the spirit of Hermes into the unknown is um, well, it's a heroic act, and um, there's a reason that we've retained heroic stories through our films and through our through our, our myths. And so, because the hero explores the unknown, the hero goes to the dragon's cave, and the hero he, he follows Hermes, he follows Mercurius. Golden snitch, that another. Mercurial symbol, I suppose, because you know it's Gryffindor, it's Slytherin, they're opposites, they're battling, and yeah, Harry's just off on some like he's just like seeing this golden snitch, like oh, like this is where it's at. So that's that's another Trinity motif, because there's an opposition. There's like you know, like Quidditch is about like us winning this game, like this versus this, like um, you know, the line of Gryffindor and the snake of Slytherin, like battling it out. And like, fair enough, it is about that, but it's also about the snitch, and actually the snitch trumps everything. And so I think this is um, Mercurius also manifesting again. That's um, actual Mercury. So another thing about alchemy is that they were metal workers, ostensibly, like on the surface. What they were doing is they were working with metals to transform lead to gold. Um, and so Mercury, Mercury is another, uh, so, so what's Mercury? Mercury is, is, is fixed and volatile. So it's liquid, which means it's volatile, so it's water, but it's also fixed because it's a metal, um, which means it constellates Sol and Luna, so it's another coincidentia oppositorum, and it's, the, it's a very interesting element. I haven't seen it myself personally. Why I understand about the symbol of, of Mercury is that the alchemists considered Mercury to be where Hermes lived. And um, the fixed and the volatile thing is a helpful thing to understand as well, because for many um, hundreds of years, um, what people thought the world was, was water, earth, air, and fire. 
and they divided this into the feminine and the masculine, water and earth, the feminine, uh, air and fire, the masculine. And so these were the alchemical elements. This was the stuff that the alchemists were working with. And um, the volatile, uh, which means um, flowing, I suppose, nature of things, is, is associated with water, with the symbol of water, with the symbol of the feminine. And then the fixed, um, the solid state, the integrated state, was associated with the masculine. And this mercury is, seems to be both. It's a bit of a curious element. And so, again, we're, we're, we're hitting this idea of that third element from a few different angles here. Here's an, al here's an alchemical drawing of, of Hermes, Mercury. Okay, this is the symbol for Mercury. Uh, spirit and grounded. Um, sun and moon. This is this the image, maybe. I, and so then here is, um, this is from a film called Pan's Labyrinth. If you're interested in alchemy, uh, Pan's Labyrinth is a good film to watch because it's essentially an alchemical dream and it retells the Gnostic myth of creation. So this is Mercury's again. He like re-manifests himself. He, he um, oh, I shouldn't say he, the spirit of Mercury, the spirit of Hermes, manif re-manifests itself through the imagination. And here's the fairy, and here's, this is a bug. But no, it's not a bug, it's now transforming itself into the fairy. So it's of the matter, it's of the spirit. And this is the thing which captures the interest of the protagonist of the film and leads her into the unknown in this meandering path unto her destiny. So it's Mercury's again, Merc Mercurius again, Hermes. Um, this is a maze, and this is this is where this is how we're approaching these ideas. Is we're going to meander around a bit like a river. We're going to go here and go there, and um, it might frustrate the order demanding intellect, which demands linearity and sequence. Um, but that's exactly the point because that's where truth lies. Because that's where Mercurius manifests. So it's, it's in this um, coincidentia oppositorum that truth is found. So it's a bit of a me meandering, our understanding of alchemy, because we might come here, we might come to a dead end, and we might meander around here. But always we're circling the center. And always in our meandering, we are coming to wholeness. We're coming to integrity. We're coming to health. We're coming to what Jung called the self. We're coming to self-understanding, self-knowledge, self-awareness through this kind of meandering pattern, this circumambulation, this circling of the center. This is in um, Chartres Quick Cathedral, I think, in France. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but um, it's another, the symbol reactualizes itself here. This is a mandala, a symbol of the self. What this also is, probably the biggest thing of alchemy that I haven't yet mentioned, is this is the philosopher's stone, okay? And this was the goal of alchemy. So the, the alchemists were trying to, in all, in all, everything they did, they were seeking the stone, they were seeking the lapis philosophorum. And the lapis is another symbol of wholeness, of integrity. And um, it was supposed to be a magical stone, and, and I'm going to come on to, come on to it, its powers and its mystery. But it was said that the, the one who possessed the lapis could transform lead into gold and would thereby become wealthy, wealthy could, could transform illness into health and would there, thereby possess the elixir of life, the aqua vitae, and um, just be, maintain health maintain balance in relationships, um, and would partake in, um, you know, um, eternal, eternal power. So that was the mystery of the Philosopher's Stone, and I'll reiterate that Newton, one of the founders of modern science, was seeking the Philosopher's Stone. So, 
So I'm going to suggest that the initial launching of the scientific project was, was nested in this kind of dream. And I think it's come a long way from this kind of, um, this, this, this essence, this quintessence of, of, of why it was born. And I think that's why, why I'm wanting to say these things. So that's another, that's a spiraling mandala. Okay, again, we're getting the same image. And so uh, I like this image because this is the best way I can explain how I'm explaining things and give a bit more context around how we're going to come to these understandings. We're going to kind of spiral here, spiral there, spiral here, and ever come closer and closer and closer to the center, to the self, to wholeness in our understanding. So Jung said there is no linear evolution. There is only a circumambulation of the self. Um, yeah, and that's, that's how we're going to approach alchemy and our understanding of alchemy today. And I think it's important to emphasize that just because I know for myself, um, the way logic itself works, the way the rational mind works is via linearity, by, by yes. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, about this, I haven't heard about this quote before, but um, I felt like I was doing some progress in my life, you know, I was fixing things and doing things, but then I felt like kind of I was spiraling back to, all the th to the things of the past, and then continue, and then spiral again, uh, you know, things of the past, and then, yeah. Yeah. It just kind of, you know, connected, you know, with me that spiral. Um, cool. Uh, Good. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a strange thing, isn't it? And I think, I suppose, what it is, is that the mind or at least rationality or the intellect or whatsoever part of ourselves that is, it, it operates in terms of linear and cause and effect. It's like, what was the cause? Where, are we, where were we? Where were we trying to go? Because that's the essence of logic, really. It's A to B, you know? But, um, 